the Real Health Podcast brought to you by Reardon Clinic. Our mission is to bring you the latest information and top experts in functional and integrative medicine to help you make informed decisions on your path to real health. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, another episode of the Real Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lucas Timms, and I have the extreme pleasure of being joined by our guest today, uh, Evelise Page, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Believe Big uh, organization and the Believe Big Institute of Health. Uh, some of you may have heard of Believe Big, um, but if not, you're going to learn all about it today and uh, how Ivelisse, through her journey with a cancer diagnosis and overcoming that, how she was able to transform her hardships into uh, a real positive light uh, through her organization to help many more patients facing cancer. And some of the really exciting things that they're doing, not only with uh, supporting patients, but with research. So uh, Ivelisse, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Tim, for having me. It's quite an honor. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. We've, uh, We've been fortunate enough to cross paths a few times over the last few years and uh, such a fan of, of you, what you do, everything that your organization does. We've had so many patients that have benefited from um, the grants of Believe Big and helping to support them with the therapies that they get through our facilities. And so uh, a big thank you on behalf of, of our clinic and our patients. Um, one of the things that uh, we wanted to uh, do today with with the podcast was to really allow our listeners to hear um, your story. Uh, I think uh, hearing stories of other uh, cancer patients who have overcame the odds and 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 um, and really not only survived but thrived uh, as you have is very inspirational, and empowering. So, if you don't mind, take us a little bit kind of through your journey from, you know, leading up to your diagnosis and everything that transpired thereafter? Yeah, well, sure. Uh, Well, I was a busy mom of four. I was actually homeschooling my kids and working in the evenings. So when I got extremely tired, I felt like I was just burning the candle at both ends. And once the summer hit and I was still extremely exhausted, uh, my husband and I knew something was wrong. I had to take three hour naps a day. And that began the investigation to figure out what was happening. And we went through a series of tests and the actual test to rule out cancer actually was the one that discovered the cancer. Uh, I had, you know, been been suffering from just extreme fatigue. You know, the interesting thing is, is that I knew the signs to look out for, and yet I didn't experience any of them. Mm. My My father was diagnosed uh, with this very same type of cancer at the very same age that I was diagnosed. And yeah, he died two years later and I was 13 at the time. And since I was 18, I was doing all the conventional, um, you know, watching and testing to make sure since I was high risk, I was doing everything right. So when I was in that hospital bed and uh, finished our, uh, the colonoscopy to rule that out, mm-hmm. the doctor comes in and here's what no one wants to hear. Uh, you have cancer. So you, you can imagine the tears began to flow and fear tried to set in and the thought of not seeing my four kids grow up and growing old with my husband, Jimmy, was really overwhelming. And, and, and this was, I mean, all from just feeling fatigued and, I, and take us back a little bit. You were, this was a while ago. You were very young. I mean, you're yeah. still very young, but back then <laughs> even younger for someone to be diagnosed with advanced stage cancer. How old were you? I was 37. Wow. Wow. 37. And, and even though you had this genetic risk or susceptibility that was known, um, it was still, it still caught you off guard, obviously being at that, at that young of an age and, and for the only symptom really being fatigue, right? 
It was the only symptom and the fatigue led to blood tests that showed that I was severely anemic. Anemic. Uh, so anemic that my doctor at, at his office, he could do the blood test there. He said, you have to go to the emergency room right now. Your organs can fail at any moment. My levels were so low. And uh, that's what you know got me to the hospital. And they started to run all these tests to try and rule it out. We'll try to figure out what's happening. Yeah, for for most people that aren't aware, um, anemia is you know a, it's a it's something that can be caught on basic blood work. But someone who's a, a female who's thirty seven, um, likely they're not running these types of labs periodically until you get a little bit older. And so, without the fatigue symptom, you probably would have never had that blood work done. Um, and the reason the anemia is caused is because when you have a tumor in in your colon, it's leaking blood. And so you're getting a lot of blood loss that way. And, and that's what leads to that anemia. But the other part of it is that, you know, typically in this country, we're not doing colonoscopies on people until they're at least 45, usually 50. So yes. um, there would have been no other way they would have caught this. No other way. And mine was also in very high in the colon. And so it wouldn't have been typically found. And so that's why the typical symptoms I knew to look out for because of my dad's case, right. I was getting a colonoscopy every five years. I was looking out for those symptoms and outside of fatigue, you know, and that could be so many things as a busy mom. <laughs> sure. So yeah, you could write that off to stress or not sleeping well, or just too much going on for a long time. And it sounds like you did for a little while. Until yeah. it just got until it just got too severe. Too yes, yes. So you have the colonoscopy. They identify the the tumor, but it wasn't just in the colon, correct? Well, it was in the colon originally, and they went ahead a week later. I had my colon resected, and at that point, I thought we were done because the pathology came back that I only had one lymph node out of twenty eight affected. And it was only because my doc, my surgeon said, you know, do your due diligence. I know you're declining the chemo and radiation, but do your due diligence and go see three different, go see an oncologist. So that's when I went to three different hospitals and I spoke to three different oncologists. And it was the one at Hopkins who performed a CAT scan on me instead of a PET scan. Mm -hmm. And when I asked him, why are you doing a CAT scan? He goes, well, Ivelisse, your uh, tumor is mucosinous and it will hide in a PET scan. So we really need to make sure that we can, this imaging can see everything we need to. And it was in his office when we were discussing all of the options that the report came back and it said that I had three lesions on my liver. And so it was at that point that I was stage four. Yeah. And just to kind of further context for the listeners, you know, typically when they remove a tumor in the digestive tract, they will sample lymph nodes in and around that part of the digestive tract. And so they can sometimes take up to 20, 30 different lymph nodes. And as you said earlier, only one of those had, um, had cancer in it. Now, cancer can spread through the lymph nodes, but it can also spread through the bloodstream. And the bloodstream is how it can get to other organs. And a very common place it can spread is, especially with colorectal cancer, is to the liver. So anytime it's gotten past the lymph nodes into another organ, you're automatically classified as stage four, which another thing that comes along with that is, oh, by the way, the, the chance of you surviving this and being cured goes down quite low. Yes, they they told me that my chances were survival were eight percent. Eight percent. Eight percent survival. You're, you're 37 years old, been healthy all your life, done all the right things, and here you are being told that you've got an eight percent survival chance. Yes. Yeah, I, I can only imagine like how that rocks your world. Oh my goodness, it was it was the biggest challenge. I even tell people that. The fear and anxiety that tries to set in, I think, was more difficult than dealing with the surgeries and the cancer itself, you know, and I always feel like there is a saying that people say that says God won't give you anything you can't handle. But I actually believe he often allows situations that are too much for us to kind of handle alone. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in these times that we realize how much we need each other. 
And most importantly, our need for him becomes so obvious. Wow. That's so, yeah, that's so well said. I love that. Um, yeah. Cause like you said earlier, at this point, you've got four young kids, right? Yes. My youngest was yeah. Five. And my oldest at that time was 13. He, he already had tough tasks for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> four kids. Yes. <laughs> so uh, he was really sending you a, a strong signal that, um, you know, you had a big, a big fight ahead of you and I that did. you needed to kind of, um, amass your, your troops, right? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> so how did everything play out from there? Obviously you get this, you know, stage four diagnosis, your, your earth's kind of been shot, uh, rattled a little bit. Um, talk us a little bit through what the, everything transpired after that. Yeah. So, you know, I was sitting in the appointment with him and I actually had a whole list of questions that now we share with patients to ask their oncologist. And one of them was, and this was before the report came in that I was stage four. I asked him, I said, what are my chances of survival? You know, one lymph node uh, at a 28 affected, I'm 37, I'm young, I'm healthy. I don't fall into the regular bucket of a 65 year old plus having colon cancer. And he looked at everything and he said, at that point, he said, I, you have a 67% chance of survival. I'm like, okay, that's great. Okay, not too bad. And then this was the question, Dr. Tim's, that just floored me. And he said, I asked him, what are my chances of survival if I did nothing? And he said, 57%. And I looked at him and I was like, wait, you mean if I did nothing, it only temp, there's a 10% difference? Right. And so that is, you know, a question that I feel isn't asked a lot. And I feel like really helps you to make wise decisions. And so for me, then the report came in and said I was stage four. And he said, well, you can throw all that out the window. Um, I, I will work with you with your more natural approach that you'd like to do. Um, but let's get you scheduled for surgery for your liver. And during that time, I, two people from two different walks of life told me that I had to speak to Dr. Hinderberger, who is the mistletoe, one of the mistletoe experts here in the U.S. Sure, and sure. I took it as a sign that I had to go see him. And it was at his office that I was told about uh, mistletoe. And I was like, as you know, isn't that what we see at Christmas time? Yeah, right. <laughs> I didn't realize how this amazing plant had so many incredible chemotherapeutic uh, substances in it to help right. my body fight for itself. And it was there at his office that I had my first injection of mistletoe. And back then, there wasn't IVC, IV mistletoe that right. was available, at least in Maryland, where I was um, being treated. And two weeks later, I went in for surgery for my liver. And, um, and 10 weeks later, I went for my follow up. And it was, I, I put December 4th, 2008 as the day when, when there's never been visible cancer in my body again. Wow. Mm -hmm. That must have been, you know, as, as, as tough as the, the diagnosis prognosis conversation you had after your initial surgery was when they found the liver the liver lesions, uh, it must have been equally as, um, as sweet on the other side of things when you got that information. Yes. Um, yeah. It because was, as we know, there's no guarantees, uh, even when they go in for what what's considered a black and white surgery or, Hey, this is going to be easy. You just never know. Yeah. And it was, he actually told me when we went in for our, uh, follow-up, I, it was the 10 weeks. I said, what are the chances that it comes back? Like that you'll see something on the scan. And this was 10 weeks later. He says, you really want to know? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> well, you want to know what we're dealing yeah. with here? And he said, 75% of the time, the cancer's back. Right. And I remember my husband looking over at me and he was like, you're going to be part of the 25. <laughs> and thankfully, right. I was. Yeah, because what most people understand is that um, what you see on a scan and even what the surgeon sees when they get in there to, to cut it out there's always more than, than, than what meets the eye when it comes to cancer. And um, unless you can get down to the cellular level, you really never know the full scope. And, you know, I think if you ask most cancer doctors, um, you know, they, they tend to overestimate the likelihood of cancer coming back. And I think one of the reasons why is that they, they know that the body's ability to defend itself has been 
uh, severely compromised, right? And they know that their treatments, whether they admit it or not, kind of make that a bigger issue along the way as well. Chemotherapy, radiation. What they don't tend to account for is someone like you who has um, stepped outside the box, if you will, uh, and maybe just by divine intervention started working with Dr. Hindenburger there and uh, actually was doing something that uh, increased and re-engaged your body's ability to defend itself through the immune system. And that was with the mistletoe therapy, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and through that, um, you know, how big of a piece of, of your puzzle it was, you know, could be, could be argued or, 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 um, or debated. But, uh, when you think about the odds and you think about how you chose a different path, to me, uh, it speaks speaks quite strongly about the the power in some individuals' cases of a therapy like mistletoe. And I know that you've made that uh, kind of a real calling card for you and everything that you've done with your organization. Um, and and it's you know it's probably good for the listeners to put a bow on it and say you know you're you're still cancer free, right? Yes. <laughs> thirteen. What is it? Thirteen years later. Thirteen years. Yes. Um, and. Um, and so, but take us through kind of the transition from, you know, getting to that state of no evidence of disease. And then how did the believe big idea come about? How did you end up, you know, birthing that organization? Yeah, so it was pretty much in two parts. So when Jimmy and I were at Hopkins waiting for our appointments, you know, it, it was incredible to me to realize that not everyone had the support system that I had from my family and church and friends. And there are many people, Dr. Timms, as you know, that are alone and just sitting there. And I remember leaning over to Jimmy and I just said, we have to do something. I think we're here for a reason and we need to find a way to encourage them. And he said, yes, but what do we do? And I went home and the next morning I actually uh, was drinking coffee from a mug and I always took my kids to this paint your own pottery place. And I just always pulled out this same mug because it had their handprints on it and it always made me smile. And I said, that's it. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have our friends and family paint these and just write somewhere on there, the word believe so that it would encourage those that are there to believe that they can get well to believe mm. that people in the community do care about them. And so we started to do that. And so Believe Mugs actually started Believe Big. And throughout the appointments, we deliver them. And now it's kind of expanded nationwide to where people can walk into a pottery store and paint. And then they're delivered locally to patients in that area. And then as I went back for my follow-up appointments, at every three months for the first year, every six months for the next two years, uh, I would talk to Dr. Diaz and say, we need to do a trial, a mistletoe. Like, I am not the only one that's benefiting. And so many people need to hear about this. It needs to be made available. And it was up until the two year mark that he kept saying, Ivelisse, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> I'm cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. And then at the two year mark, he's like, do you know how monumental this is? He said, all right, let's let's get working and let's start this clinical trial. And then Believe Big was formed to kind of be the funding source to start uh, raising the funds for the trial. Yeah, that's uh, it, says, it took him a while to to kind of come around. Yeah, I mean, you, and you see that with 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 uh, oncologists that, you know, they're they're reluctant to, if they know patients are doing something outside the standard of care to give much credence to it. But we have had some other patients in our experience, like your case, where it just becomes the, it, it's so overwhelmingly obvious that, uh, that the different path that patients choosing is what's making the difference in some cases. And so, um, uh, it's fun to see the oncologist come around and, you know, it's interesting because I think when you and I first crossed cross paths was uh, about eight years ago mm -hmm. um, in Germany at a mistletoe symposium. And I know that that was part of the sort of origins of this monumental research that you guys have gotten involved with, with Johns Hopkins. And so take us kind of fast forward a little bit into when that whole project started and where it's at today. 
Yeah, so we started having conversations with uh, Hopkins and Dr. Hindenburger, myself and my husband. We would sit down monthly for meetings and start to develop a team that would help to design the trial. And then we brought in researchers from Germany and uh, Hiloxor, who is um, one of the mistletoe manufacturers in Europe. They agreed to provide the mistletoe for the trial. And some of their experts also helped in the designing of it. And so interestingly enough, uh, a few years later, the trial, uh, the FDA approved it to start. And in, it was on December 24th, <laughs> the approval came through. And I was like, how amazing that yep. the mistletoe trial got approved on December 24th. Uh, and so the good news is that it was completed in April. And we are now, they, they are in the process of publishing the reports in the new journals and, of oncology. And so hopefully within the next six months, it'll be peer reviewed and published. And then we can start in the phase two process of the trial. So phase one research, this is like early stage research that's done in humans. Uh, I believe you guys had around 50 or 60 patients enrolled. Yes. And um, interesting to note that they were treating them with IV mistletoe. Yes. Which is, uh, you know, a little bit more of a, a recent development. You know, for years and years, it was traditionally just given subcutaneously. I know that you did most of your mistletoe treatment subcutaneous, but uh, more recent research. And now with this Johns Hopkins research, uh, we're looking at intravenous applications and uh, could be even more promising, although. The sub Q still works pretty good. Obviously, it did for you. Um, so exciting. And in phase one, you know, that's just the first step, obviously. So I think it's important for people to understand that even though that gets when that gets published, it's still likely that you're not going to be getting that pres you know, mistletoe prescribed from your oncologist. But it's the first step in that ultimate process of getting through phase one, phase two, phase three, which can then lead to sort of full FDA approval, uh, which is a lofty goal, but hey, one step at a time, right? One step at a time. And I think, you know, trying to think, what can we do for the patients of today? And we're so grateful for physicians like yourself that can still help patients with mistletoe, both avenues, you know, today. But the long term of this trial is so important to make it a part of standard of care and have insurance cover it. As you know now, everything's out of pocket. And so having this covered by insurance would be such a huge aid to patients that are confronted with a cancer diagnosis. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, the the, the uh, fact that only some individuals are able to access this medicine um, is a real shame because of how really how ubiquitously it can be applied to the field of cancer care, whether it's in patients with active disease or prevention, secondary prevention, helping patients tolerate uh, traditional treatments better. There's so many applications for it. And the fact that, you know, only a very small fraction of US cancer patients are, are being, are, are able to access it both financially and then some of them just don't, aren't aware of it, right? Or there's yes. not anybody in their area that offers it. And so we're getting there, but um, yeah, I mean, you're, Y'all's contributions, Believe Big, Johns Hopkins, that is the ultimate vehicle, how we get to uh, sort of that critical mass point where everyone can benefit from this medicine. And uh, so kudos to you guys, your team. I know it's been a, a long time coming and a lot of hard work's been put in, but thank you on behalf of doctors like myself, patients, caregivers. Uh, we've seen um, the, the fruits of your labor Hmm. on the front lines here with our patients, um, not only through the medicine, but through the grants that you guys give. Uh, I've painted a few Believe Big mugs myself at the local pottery place. I encourage, I encourage everybody to uh, uh, do that in their area. We see the smiles that that brings to patients. And um, so we love everything about what you guys do. Uh, and thank you for sharing your story with our, with our listeners. Um, it's very empowering and inspiring. And, mm -hmm. um, and keep up the good work and, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon down the road. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the real health podcast. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. 
You can also find all of the episodes and show notes over at realhealthpodcast.org. Also, be sure to visit reardonclinic.org where you will find hundreds of videos and articles to help you create your own version of real health.